Pleasure to meet you and catch up with you. 80 years of age nearly on Christmas Day and still going strong. What's the secret? Uh, the secret is to do everything that the doctors say you shouldn't do. Drink a bottle of tarot a day, 20 cigarettes, sinning as often as possible. But as Mrs. Patrick Campbell said, I don't mind if you do it in the boudoir. Don't do it in the streets and frighten the horses. So there's the secret. Then people have wanted to know that for years. How did it all begin for you? Before the media, what was the, what was the early Stuart Hall up to? Well, I was a racing driver, but I never won a race. I was always second, third or fourth. I went down to Crystal Palace as a footballer. They offered me £20 a week and £10 in the summer. And I said, well, that won't keep me in tarts and fags. So I want to be rich. I want to be filthy, stinking rich. So I joined my father in the catering business and baking confectionery and little factories. I said, I want to be McVitie and Dad, you can be Price, McVitie and Price. I want to be stinking rich. But Dad didn't want to grow that big. So I said, well, that's it. I'm into broadcasting, and that's how I began. How did your break in broadcasting come then? I auditioned for about a year, interviewing my compatriots like Peter Collins, Mike Hawthorne, Sterling Moss, Tony Brooks, submitted a million interviews, and it finally got, got through. And the first job they gave me was uh, a football match for uh, Sports Report, which was Sheffield Wednesday 4, Leicester City, or Leicester Foss, as I call them, 4. And I went back and described graphically each goal, none of which I'd seen because the whole match was shrouded in fog. I made it all up, and I've been lying ever since. You've got a unique style, of course, in your, your match reports. Is that something that you'd already planned? No, you can't plan. I, I've instructed several youngsters throughout their careers and said, don't emulate anybody. Don't come out of a sausage machine. Don't come off the factory production line. Create your own style. Stick with it. Either people like it or they don't. If they don't, well, you can go back to being a bank clerk or whatever. And fortunately, I've got several nutty people throughout the world who enjoy what I do. I create, and they enjoy, and they tell me, which gives me the greatest of pleasure. And I owe it all, really, to my Irish mother, uh, who was very fond of words and steeped in literature. My headmaster, I was head boy at school, the Gauleiter, who immersed me in the brine tub of English. He said, I won't receive pronunciation from you all. I want an example. <coughs> In the tub you go. There's Shakespeare, there's Browning, there's Shelley, there's Keats, there's George Bernard Shaw, there's Oscar Wilde. Develop it, develop it. And remember, in Life Hall, everything matters, but nothing matters terribly. And of course that style has been your benchmark for many years and but in an age now where football's very much sort of pre-packaged we've got the Premier League we've got Sky does it disappoint you that we haven't got a sort of many characters in the game as you used to have sort of 20, 30, 40 years ago? Well you're not allowed to have character because it's coached out of you I mean the great players when I go down the years of Matthews, Lofthouse Finney Dave Mackay Danny Blanchflower great individuals who had God-given talent and were allowed to express it so in other words if you wanted to dribble half the length of the pitch, which I used to do in, in my day, for the sheer joy of beating players. You can't do that. I used to be very fond of Liverpool and go to Bill Shankly and, and Paisley. And I said to Sammy Lee one day, I said, Sammy, I'll give you 100 quid if you can beat me, because I've never seen you beat a man. Your job is to stay on the touchline, receive the ball and give it to the nearest red shirt. It was coached out of them. All that, 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 that beauty, that balletic movement, the skills, Apart from Barcelona, Real Madrid, a few clubs like Manchester United, they don't allow players to express themselves fully. They're there organised in a system because now football's big business. It's all money. It's divorcing itself from the fan. And the gap is getting wider. Eventually, it will have to come back together again. And hopefully in the next two or three years, when we have saturation in football. You must have met numerous characters down the years. Is there one that you can particularly pick out as, you, as being your favourite? Oh, my word, there, is, there, there are so many of them. I mean, Bill Shankly was an old friend of mine. He used to uh, instruct me in the boot room. The art of football. I said, just stand there and tell you about the football. I said, you can't tell me about football. I've just played in one of your charity matches. I've just scored two goals against Roger Hunt with a cop chanting my name, 53,000 people. Don't tell me how to play football. He says, you haven't started yet. You're just young in your career. He says, listen to me. Then there was Bob Paisley. Joe Mercer, what a fabulous man, Uncle Joe, he's a fantastic guy. And down the, down the years, I mean, I mean, Dennis Law, George Best, I knew them all, I roistered with them all in Slack Alice, 
when, when life was free in the 60s and 70s when you would you go and have a few pints of ale and then go out and play football. <laughs> Not always going to bed at 10 o'clock and, uh, and, and having a diet of cereals and uh, skimmed milk. It was a, a haunch of venison, roast beef, pints, wagons of ale, loads of claret, lots of champagne, a girl on each arm, then go out and then chant the world. Wonderful, wonderful characters. And of course, the, you've been allowed to whack to Liverpool about Manchester City. That's your, one of your passions. What have you made of it? A, what's going on there at the moment and, and down the years, what, the, the entertainment, or, if not, that they've served up? When I first fell in love, uh, when during the war, there was a wonderful, listen, beautiful inside forward called Peter Doherty playing for Manchester City. He was just so wonderful to watch and he delighted in beating players. It was always on the balls of his feet. He was dancing on air. He was like Nijinsky. It was like ballet or the last act of Tristan Untaisolder. I was only 10 years old and I fell in love with the beautiful game and I coined the phrase the beautiful game because of Peter Doherty. And in those days United used to play during the war at the theatre of based comedy, which I've always called Main Road, <laughs> because their place was bombed out. The Germans bombed Old Trafford and they had a fantastic team, of course. And Matt Busby was a great friend of mine. And he always used to say, why can't you support Manchester United? I said, it was because of Peter Doherty. Peter uh, inspired me, inspired a love of football uh, and a love of the beauty of the game, value of the game above the prize. And that's what Doherty did. And down the years, of course, um, I'd become affiliated with Manchester City. I used to go and play with, uh, with Francis Lee and uh, Summerby and Bell and Bookie and Alan Oates. And, uh, we used to run up, run up and down the stands at Main Road in Eskimo suits with Joe Mercer and Malcolm Allen saying, come on, come on, come on, the threat is coming out there. I can see the grease coming out of your shoes, you know. And it was, there were wonderful days and, and great roistering days. It was fantastic. I used to go to Bolton Wanderers and uh, my car was snowed in one day. After a match, my Jensen Interceptor 3 was snowed in under three feet of snow. And uh, Sam Allardyce's wife came out of Burnham Park and actually pushed my Jensen Interceptor <laughs> out of the car park. Can you, can you imagine asking Ryan Giggs or Vidic <laughs> or Fletcher to push my Jensen out of a car park? And, but those days, you see, there was that great, wonderful aura about football. It was a great friendship. I mean, when I first started football, the players used to come to the matches on the bus or the tram or a battered old Ford Anglia. Uh, so naturally, they were associated with the, with the guys and the women, of course, who went to the football games because that great bond was there. Now, it doesn't exist anymore. The other night when I had a birthday party, the BBC gave me a birthday party. They were all there, recollecting the old days, but they recollected with rocking smiles, with great smiles. When was the last time you saw a player laugh mm -hmm. on the pitch? And I said to Francis Lee, do you recollect the time when we were at Derby County? And uh, he'd made his money, Francis. Yeah. And, uh, and I said, give me something special. Give me something special today at the baseball ground. So they were beating QPR 4-0. High ball out of defence. Francis trapped it with his bum, <laughs> flicked it up in the air out of about a foot of mud and scored. And then he went, are you happy with that? <laughs> You can't imagine that happening today. They don't, have the, they don't have that joie de vivre about the game that they had. There's too much money in it. That sense of fun as well. I also saw you uh, involved in It's a Knockout. I grew up watching that. How much did you enjoy that programme as well? Well, we made it something special. 80 million people used to watch that live every, every Friday. And uh, I used to pray for things to go wrong. And then I could show them what we were made of, what the BBC was made of when everything went wrong and everything crashed, a German covered wagon crashed in one game, you know, and I've got the Germans on, on, on one knee, captain there, male captain here, female captain here, and everything, everything was come to a halt. I thought, this is what I pray for. I pray for this. So I said, the German team of captain, the Cambridge of Germany, shall we let them have another go? The, the crowd, there were 40,000 there. I said, no, it's going to be silly. There are 30 million Germans watching tonight, watching us, watching our sporting spirit, the greatest sporting nation in the world. Now make up your mind. In the meantime, me and the Germans will sing a little song. Little, <laughs> sing it often in Germany. So I said, right, after me, says, I'm 
zwei, drei. There'll always be an England. <laughs> And they sang the song. And 30 million Germans couldn't believe it. They were in shock. They could they said, what is this? What's Hall doing? What's he doing? Can you drum sing? They'll always be in England. So I then turned to the crowd and said, well, your decision now. Are the Germans to have another go? Because if they have another go, they'll win. And, and they'll win the silver trophy. And Britain will be second. And all the crowd said, yes. <laughs> yes. I said, oh, sure. Said, yes. Yes. I said, well, I don't want the game doing in silence. Remember, we're the greatest sporting nation of all time. The Germans did it. The covered wagon. There were four Germans pulling this covered wagon to, to rescue a damsel being burnt at the stake by the Indians. Visualize the scene. And the Germans won <laughs> One in Germany, it hit the national press. Can, we can't believe what a nation, what a sporting nation. They are fantastic. Actually cheering on a German team to beat the British. I was very happy. And yes. that was the spirit of knockout.